I am Ash Dykes, an adventurer and extreme athlete. I've always been fascinated with China since I ventured there back in 2010. I left and realised I had only just touched the surface. I was always curious about taking on an adventure there and experience firsthand the wonders of this massive country. This is my most ambitious mission to date. I've faced a lot of different challenges before from crossing Mongolia, walking the length of Madagascar, but this by far is, is the toughest test, physically and mentally. I'll be trekking almost 4,000 miles, which will take me at least one year to complete, anticipated to be over 8 million steps. My next mission is to attempt to become the first person to walk the entire length of the Yangtze River. The source of the Yangtze is the highest source of any major river around the world at an altitude at over 5,100 meters situated in the Tibetan Plateau. The severity of the challenge isn't to be underestimated. I will be facing a lot of dangers throughout. The sub-zero temperatures, there are bears, there are wolves, there's snakes, and of course the demands that I will face mentally and physically with the expedition being over one year to complete. Fitness has always been a key element. It prepares me physically, it prepares me mentally. I find the more you throw yourself into uncomfortable scenarios, the more comfortable you become. It will be packed full of new experiences and amazing people that I'll meet along the way that I hope to share the stories of. I'm wanting this to be one of the world's most interactive expeditions to date. I will be keeping everyone posted, so please do follow the journey. The trailer that you saw then was for Mission Yangtze, a world first expedition that I had completed only around two months ago now, so I'm fresh from completing this particular journey. But a lot of people only really ever see the highlights, you know, the cool things in the background, the scenic, um, mass, mass scenic areas that you come across if you like. But what a, what a lot of people don't see is the hardship and the struggles. And I want to talk to you guys about that, because often after finishing an expedition of this magnitude, I come across a lot of people who say, wow, I would love to do this one day, or I'd love to experience this. But that's only because they ever see the showreel, if you like. What they don't see is the struggles. And this photo is a perfect example. Low quality, an awful image. You know, you can't really, it's all blurry. But I took this photo only around four or five weeks in to this 12-month mammoth expedition. And it was at this point, I had already lost six members of the team who had joined me through either altitude sickness, injury, fear of wildlife. They all made it back home safely, of course, thankfully. I had faced bears. I was stalked for two days by a pack of wolves. I had faced yaks, wild yak to Tibetan mastiffs, snow blizzards to minus 20 degrees Celsius was pulled in by the authorities on five different occasions and now 50% of my team in China and the UK were telling me to call the expedition off. Try again next year. You've left it too late, there's too many dangers and you're, you're already held back from starting this expedition by two months. However, I couldn't do that. I put too much time, energy and effort into this expedition. It took two years to plan. I believed in my preparation and I believe that through the previous almost decade worth of experience, I had what it took to complete this expedition. But where, would that, where did that confidence and experience come from? Well, let me take you on a brief journey to how it all began. So before all of the travels started, I was actually traveling around Southeast Asia, um, Australia. I was then working as a master scuba diving instructor in Thailand for two years, as well as competing in the martial arts of Muay Thai before I started feel, feeling rather settled and I looked to see what expedition I could take on next. And at that stage, at age 21, which was my biggest expedition, was to attempt to become the first person to walk solo and unsupported across Mongolia, a 78-day journey that would take 1,500 miles to complete. Now, there was only evidence to suggest that one person had attempted this before, but unfortunately, he was evacuated on three different occasions. 
and I looked more into this guy and realized he was a desert explorer, a Navy soldier, and I was just a 21-year-old living on a beach. So what hope did I have? But like with anything in life, I believe just because no one has found a way to do something, it doesn't mean it can't be done. And I believe with the right logistics, with the right preparation, then maybe I can complete this particular journey. So I set off, and the Altai Mountains were just beautiful in the far west of Mongolia. I had three weeks to walk over the Altai Mountains, five weeks across the Gobi Desert, and a further three weeks through the Mongolian Steppe. Now, in order to survive this expedition, I needed to carry everything that I needed to survive on a trailer weighing 18 stone or 120 kilograms. I was completely solo, completely unsupported. In fact, I took this own photo, I set the camera up on the, on the tripod. The Altai Mountains were very cold. I, I eventually reached the Gobi Desert, which offered a, a load of sandstorms, which was very painful. But probably the biggest danger, not just to the expedition, but to my life, was the sheer temperature of the Gobi Desert. It exceeded 40 degrees Celsius. Week after week, I was suffering deeper and deeper into dehydration on my way to heat stroke, which is usually fatal. The trailer was now a nightmare to try to pull through the often gravel and soft sand. I was delirious. I was completely dehydrated. I was hallucinating. I could almost feel my organs drying up through lack of water. And the only shelter that I could find was actually underneath my trailer. And it was at a point similar to this, where I would rest for almost 45 minutes at a time. And it, it was that point and that realization, almost shock of capture, that if I don't keep getting up from out of my trailer and pushing on, I could quite easily die out here in the Gobi Desert. That scared me. I only now had four days to make it to the next water source, sort of rationing my last remaining dribbles of water. But I couldn't picture four days. I couldn't visualize walking four days on my own in that heat, pulling that weight. I was in agony. So I had to break my goals down. I could visualize 100 meters. You know, I could see 100 meters. So there was no reason why I couldn't get out of my trailer after only resting for five minutes, pushing on for 100 meters before resting for another five minutes. And by focusing on the little steps rather than the big daunting and overwhelming task of making it to the next water source, I was able to tick off these small sections and fortunately did just about make it. I was off the radar for a good eight days trying to recover, but bucked up that mental and physical strength enough to be able to continue and fortunately complete that expedition, becoming the first recorded person to walk solo and unsupported across Mongolia. Now, this opened up a whole lot of new opportunities, but most importantly, it allowed me to follow what I was passionate about. I was able to follow my heart, which I think is really important, no matter what direction you're trying to take. You've almost, almost got to listen to your gut. And that brings in Madagascar, the fourth largest island in the world. 80% of all plant life and wildlife found on this island is found nowhere else in the world, which makes it incredibly unique, and is what attracted me to attempt to walk from the most southern point all the way to the most northern point via its interior while summiting the eight highest mountains along the way. But Madagascar, of course, is probably more famous for the movie, <laughs> but none of these actually exist there apart from the lemurs. And there's over 100 different species of lemur found in Madagascar. And with all of my adventures, I always try to look at the bigger picture. So with Mongolia, I was helping to raise funds for the Red Cross, but also helping to raise awareness for climate change and the effects that it has on the nomadic way of life. And with Madagascar, I partnered up with the Lima Network Conservation that have 60 different organizations on the ground helping to protect and preserve the unique biodiversity, which is amazing. I believe we live in a world full of negativity. You only have to switch on the TV to find yourself surrounded by negative news. I, I'm a big believer that positive spreads positivity. So I wanted to highlight all of the amazing efforts that these guys were doing to help preserve the biodiversity. But talking of wildlife, probably one of my favorite was the giant comet moth. You can see here, literally bigger than his hand, beautiful. And along the way, it's tradition that in order to summit the highest mountain in Madagascar, you must carry yourself a white living cockerel in order to protect you from the bad spirits and witches of the forest. So I'm all about res respecting the local culture. So meet Gertrude. <laughs> Gertrude was with me for two and a half weeks. 
I had to feed him, I had to give him water, I had to look after him. Often I could let him loose out of my bag, he would just follow behind me as I would walk off and he would sleep on top of my tent, which sounds great, but the next morning you'd find a load of chicken poo either side of the tent, not the best. But he was a strong warrior of a chicken, and after two and a half weeks, he did make the highest mountain. You can see him in my backpack there. He didn't do much of the walking, of course, but, <laughs> but there you have it. But it wasn't all just chickens and butterflies. There were some real dangers along the way. I had many river crossings, <laughs> and a lot of those rivers had crocodiles. Uh, I was held up at gunpoint by the military. I had to avoid bandits along the way. I had to utilize the jungle to hunt, to gather food, to survive, often just machete in hand, hacking my way through the bush for 14 hours, but only covering around four to five kilometers. And unfortunately, I contracted the deadliest strain of malaria. And I didn't know what was happening to me. I thought it was something similar to what I faced in the Gobi Desert with my hallucinations and my agonizing pain. And it was at this point I had no option. I had to keep getting up and pushing on to the next community which I believed had local transport that could take me to a nearby hospital. And whilst I was in agony, completely delirious, I had no motivation. But with anything in life, no matter what you're working towards, it's important to understand that you can't always be motivated, but you can be disciplined. And it was through discipline and great hardship that I kept getting up, pushing pushing my way forward until I made it to the hospital and had the disease eradicated completely. Of course, my mum was on the phone. Get back, what are you doing? You know, it's not a cold, it's not a flu. Actually, you've got one of the deadliest diseases in human history. But I believed again that I was in the right hands, that I could make a full recovery. Despite losing 13 kilograms, I was able to stay in the hotel, train up, swim, push up, sit ups, and try to, try to continue visualizing making the finish line. And I did. Uh, it was one month into a five-month journey that I contracted the malaria, but I was able to get back up, push on, and after five months in total, I made it to the most northern point of the island, becoming the first recorded person to do that, while summiting the eight highest mountains. And that brings me finally onto Mission Yangtze, pretty much the biggest thing that I could find in the world that hadn't yet been done. And what attract, attracted me was the beauty and diversity of China, how you can go from west to east and, and discover so much from the different weather systems, terrains, the people, the food, the culture. And I really wanted to walk from source to sea of the Yangtze River. Very tedious planning. It took me two years to prepare for something like this. I had to get the right officials, uh, government on board, permits, visas. I had to prepare. You can see how intimidating this landmass was. But I eventually, after two years, got myself to a place called Dali, where I was able to train in Yunnan province, now at altitude, but also practice the local customs and learn the local language. As I said, Wu Shu Zhong Wen Yi Dian Dian. And whilst I was doing this, things were, were coming together. I was excited to eventually push on. And now this was a huge milestone for my adventuring career. I was, I was with a film crew from Discovery Channel, from Nat Geo. You know, I was excited. I could throw away my GoPro and my selfie stick. And I was super enthusiastic about that. But that lasted only one day, unfortunately. My, my camera crew caught altitude sickness. They were okay. They had to be sent home, though. And this just kept repeating itself. It was almost camera crew after camera crew after guide get an altitude sickness and I was constantly having to send them back but eventually after a long time we did finally make the true and scientific source of the Yangtze River and the journey finally commenced only four members down but day one we've got 12 months left and it was beautiful Qinghai province very wild often we were just sat gawping into complete wilderness but of course there were dangers that of the wild yak that we'd have to set Chinese firecrackers off, often two o'clock in the morning, just to scare them off. We came across Tibetan Mastiffs, which were, of course, very aggressive at times as well. We were stalked and followed for two days by a pack of wolves. And of course, I'm sure you all know these footprints. Bears, they were now coming off the mountain peaks because it was too cold, looking for food before they went into hibernation, and we were walking food. And often I'd have locals sending me photos and videos saying, you're here at the wrong time, get yourself off the mountains, you shouldn't be here. And here's a video that they sent me. <coughs> a 
very close, very scary. I remember replying to these people, sending me the photos. Stop it. You know, stop sending me these images and photos. I'm already scared, all right? But uh, I would have no trucks to, to scramble over, if you like. I was just out in complete wilderness. And often, I would try to stay with the, with the locals in their uh, gurs because they were so friendly, so hospitable, offered food, warmth, and shelter. Which brings me back to this image, how now half the team were saying, there's been too many dangers, you've lost six team members already, let's call it off. But now, all of the previous experience played such a, a crucial part. If it wasn't for Mongolia and Madagascar, maybe I couldn't have even attempted this mission. But experience, no matter what industry you're in, you've always got to start from ground zero, from the bottom of the ladder and work your way up. And whilst no one else could see me completing this, I could see it for myself. And that self-belief was what was crucial at this point in time. I pushed on, of course, facing the winter through the minus 20 degrees Celsius, and eventually finally got myself off the mountains where I was greeted by the first bend of the Yangtze River in Yunnan province, which was just beautiful. I was now coming across more locals, more people. I was getting to, to know their, their culture, their traditions, and even trying their local delicacies. You want to see a video of me eating this raw? <laughs> Pasha worms, living in the shallow water off the riverbank, concealing itself within cracks and under rocks. Cheers. <laughs> Once you get past the, the blood and the yellow pus and oh, swallow that, uh -huh. it becomes crunchy. And when its legs stop wriggling, uh -huh. it becomes yeah, a little weird. bit more enjoyable. And that's what it is all about, you know, getting involved with the locals, doing what they do, no matter where you are in the world. And that's what I loved the most. The walking and the hiking, for me, is actually the boring part. It's the magic that happens in between. And, but it wasn't just about the challenges, the people I met, showing off the beauty of China and all the cultures, but also there was important messages, environmental messages and sustainability messages. And along the way, I'd be shouting about this. And actually, I carried myself, what you can see with me here today, was a water-to-go filtration bottle. And it allowed me to drink from any water source, including the Yangtze, actually drinking directly from the Yangtze. Any water source except for salt water. And it gets rid of 99.9% .9 of all bacteria and contaminants. But most importantly, along the journey, it stopped me from using almost 1,400 half-liter single-use plastic bottles, which are extremely har harmful to the environment. So we would provide talks at schools along the way and often give bottles away for free at these, at these schools. Take them out on litter picking events along the Yangtze Riverbank and partner up with organization and environmentalists about all of the amazing work that they're doing to help protect the Yangtze and many other waterways across China. This is the Yangtze sturgeon fish that they were releasing back into the wild, really important to the ecosystem of the Yangtze, but also the finless porpoise dolphins, beautiful smiling dolphins. For many years, they've been on the decrease, but in recent years, for the first time in a long time, the numbers have started to steady, and they believe within the next few years, they'll finally be on the increase, which is amazing news. These are the real unsung heroes doing their everything that they can to protect the environment. But I pushed on, and as I said at the start, China has a little bit of every country in one. Uh, I can't describe the sites that I came across, but how different they were all the way through. It was truly beautiful. And of course, it was one of the world's most interactive missions to date, most interactive world firsts, where we were getting people involved. And towards the end, I had over 100 people trekking with me over the finish line in Shanghai. We were live streaming to millions across the world. And eventually, on day number 352, I eventually crossed the finish line where the Yangtze meets the East China Sea, becoming the first recorded person to walk the Yangtze River. But a lot of these stories, you know, I named this Lessons Learned from the Extremes because you're not all going to walk through a desert, of course, but we all do kind of face our own struggle. No matter what we're doing, no matter what background, we all hit a point where we feel we can't continue. And I feel lessons that I've learned in the extremes help me in everyday life, even when I'm back into the city, back home with family. I now focus on not overwhelming myself with the long goal, but focusing on the little steps that can help us achieve our final goal. So by breaking 
steps down to 100 meters at a time, I, was, I ended up surviving. It wasn't a case of winning or losing, it was a case of living or dying. And that can be related to anything we do in life. There's always a way. With Madagascar, of course, catching malaria, there was no other option apart from survival. But the thing that I learned here was the fact that we can't always be motivated, but we can be disciplined. Something, again, that can be applied into everyday life. And finally, the Yangtze River, which brings me back to this image. It doesn't matter if no one else sees it for you. Whatever your dream, whatever your goal, whatever your vision, you know, it's so crucially important that you protect it, that you nurture it, that you continue to believe in. Because it doesn't matter if no one else sees it for you. What's important is if you see it for yourself. Thank you very much. Shishi Neiman.